Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You are most welcome to our sixth Gazi session for 2016. My name is Abigail Murray. I work for the Soldana by IDZ, responsible for enterprise development. As always, Togazi is called Talks on the Oil and Gas Industry, and we're doing it to inform um, our small businesses to get them to a state of readiness for the investors that plan to set up shop in the IDZ. Our session today is about occupational health and safety, and at the end of the session we will have a lucky draw where you stand the chance to um, attend the training course offered by NOSA. It is um, a prerequisite for any business to enter any of, of the sites and it's valued at 7,000 Rand. So normally the introduction is not a very long introduction, but I think it's also just appropriate to welcome in our midst our Deputy Mayor from the Sultana Bay Municipality. I think we are honored to have our leaders attend these sessions. It also shows commitment to the development of our local community. So without further ado, I'd introduce to you our speaker today, Ms. Faldila Hassan from NOSA. Enjoy the session. Thank you. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Abigail for the op yeah, to come and talk at your, at your meeting. My career started at the Department of Labor back in 92 as an occupational health and safety inspector after graduating from the University of Cape Town with a medical honors in ergonomics. I worked as an inspector for nine years and that's obviously where we do enforcement of occupational health and safety legislation. So part of the functions of an inspector is obviously visiting employers, making sure that they comply with legislation, do incident investigations, complaint investigations, and also recommending prosecutions if they're not complying with legislation. I was there for nine years, and then I went over to LexisNexis. I don't know if you're familiar with LexisNexis. They're the book publishers. I worked there as a she consultant for about seven years. And then I joined NOSA. Um, after a four-year break, I jo joined NOSA in 20, September 2012. So I've been there for four years. It's about 20 years in the industry. So hopefully I can teach you something about health and safety with this session. Um, normally what we're saying with, with businesses when they start out um, with, with, um, with their business and operations, we normally say everybody's always concerned about management systems. But it's more important that you also understand your um, liabilities, your legal requirements that you have to comply with. Because if you're not complying with legislation, first of all, there's obviously liabilities that you can incur. So normally, with our training, we normally try to explain to students you know, what is liability. So liability, we normally say it's the legal responsibility uh, or responsibility in front of the law and who can uh, incur liability. That's usually what we call, refer to a natural person or a juristic person. Natural person being a man or a woman, like you and me, or a juristic person like a company for an act or an omission, something that you've done or something that you didn't do that you were supposed to do. And so normally we say you can incur uh, liability in terms of legislation. So when we talk about legislation, the different, uh, in our framework, it's a SA legal framework, we get sources of law at, at constitution level, which is obviously supreme law in the country. Then we also have national legislation, which is the legislation that we normally work with in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act or the COID Act, the NEMA. And then you also have legislation at a lower level, at municipality level. That's normally where we talk about the municipal ordinances, the bylaws. And then we also have common law sources. Right? So that's not law that we've, legislation that we've written. It's more legislation that we've, or laws that we've inherited, especially from previous colonies that were here, like your English and the Dutch colonies that were here. Then in South Africa, there's mainly two types of liabilities that you can, that you can incur. So it's either criminal liability, where we're saying the state charges a person with a crime, right? Or it's civil liability, where private parties litigate against each other. Right? Then you can also incur liability due, due to the term of delict, right? so where there was a breach of duty of care, right? where you suffered a harm or a loss. 
where you can then sue in terms of civil liabilities. This is just another diagram to depict the different types of liabilities that we get. So I said criminal liabilities where obviously the state takes action against you or a company and then civil liability is where the private parties litigate. So normally we're saying you can incur, for example, criminal liability or civil liability through legislation or even through common law. So if we talk about the, the legislation that we normally focus on, which is the SHE legislation, we focus on the Occupational Health and Safety Act, right, the COID Act and the NEMA. So we're normally saying if you're not complying with legislation, especially if you are an employer, there's certain duties imposed on you, you're not complying with that, then you can incur criminal liability in terms of you, uh, it's obviously the inspectors can take action against you, they recommend prosecution, and obviously it goes to court like that. Then also through um, COIDA, we know that employees must be registered in terms of a compensation, COIDA meaning Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act. So we know if you're not um, registered with COIDA, obviously also that's a, a contravention and the state can take action against you. And then also in terms of NEMA, the National Environmental Management Act, also, if you're not complying in terms of legal requirements around your environmental aspects and impacts, also the state can take action against you, right? So that falls under criminal liability. But then we're also saying, in the event, for example, if an employee suffers an injury, right, and if that injury actually results in death, then you can also be charged in terms of common law, where we're saying that the state, usually what the state has to do is the state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you had the intention to kill that person, right? then normally they charge you with murder. However, if you think in terms of your work setup, right? if somebody falls into a machine, he dies, it wasn't your intention to kill that person, right? but because you were negligent, obviously the, ch the state can charge you with negligence, but then they charge you with culpable homicide. Right? So in terms of section 38 of the OSH Act, they actually give you the, the penalties on offences with actually saying, if the person has died, the person has died, they can actually charge you with, um, you can be regarded as guilty in the, in the case of culpable homicide. So the state can either charge you with a contravention in terms of legislation, or they can charge you in terms of culpable homicide. Right? And then on the same, on the civil liability side, where we're saying private parties can litigate, private parties suing each other in terms of either legislation, so we were saying COIDA, NEMA also features, usually features under legisla legislation, civil liability, where we were saying private parties can also sue, you as a person can sue a company if you find, or you can interdict against the company if you find that company is maybe dumping chemicals in water or what have you. So that is normally um, seen as civil liability because it's a person taking action, right? Or in terms of the COID Act, in terms of Section 36, a non-employee can sue uh, an employer. If you are a non-employee, you can sue an employer for an injury or a disease right, that you sustained at a particular company or a premises. That is in terms of, in terms of civil liability. So COIDA, even NEMA, also makes provision for civil litigation, whereas the OSH Act doesn't make provision for civil litigation. In other words, what we're saying is, as if an employee gets injured at work, he cannot sue his employer for that injury that he sustained. Right? So it's always just the state that will take action against that employer. So it's either going to be in terms of Section 8, right? obviously in terms of Section 38 giving the penalties. But um, yeah, so, so normally we're saying uh, the civil, there's only, you can only incur criminal liability through the OSH Act, whereas with COID Act and the NEMA, you can even incur civil liability, where private parties can also take action against you. And so that's basically how we normally depict um, civil liability and criminal liability. Then there's other types of liability that you can also get. Uh, the vicarious liability, where they're saying you are being held liable for someone else's acts and omissions. So in other words, your employee operates a machine, he gets injured, you as an employer can be held liable. Right, that is what they refer to as vicarious liability. And in terms of Section 37, that is a typical example where they're saying um, there's three, only three, on the basis of three points where the employer can prove that he's not 
that he can't be held liable for that particular incident. The first thing is, is that he's got to prove that there was, it was not within the connivance of that employee. In other words, an employer walked past the machine, I will pause the employee operating machine, the machine was not guarded, and he allowed the person to carry on. In other words, he knew the person was doing something wrong, but he allowed it to carry on. So that's the first thing he must prove, that there was no connivance. Right? So in other words, sometimes employer allows, the employers allow it, because obviously it's, the worker works faster, speeds up production, so they just allow the, the workers to carry on like that. So that's the first thing the employer must prove. The other issue that the employer must prove is that the employee was working outside of the scope of authority. So in other words, the employee himself went out, say for example, he was, thank you, he was um, employed to operate, for example, a grinding machine, but on a particular day he maybe had a private job or something he wanted to do, and then he went and operated the circular saw. So he went out of his scope of authority. So it's either in, in, in that manner, or we, a supervisor, called the employee, and he said, your colleague is not in today, he's off sick, yet you have to go and work that, up, that machine so that the production can go out. Right? So that's also where the person is out of his scope of authority. So the employer must prove that he was not aware right? or that person himself went out of his scope of authority. And the last uh, point that he has to prove not to take liability for the incident is where he must show that he has taken every steps, whatever is reasonably practicable to avoid that incident from happening. So normally, where do employers start? And students always say, yeah, training, training. But I always say to students, you think in terms of Section 8, right? because Section 8 gives you the duties of an employer. And in that, all that duties includes the fact that the, there must have been risk assessments done, there must have been safe work procedures, there must have been um, supervision, all of that, even enforcement. Right? So normally, we say enforcement is more than just telling the person, you know, put up the guard. Right? You sit down the person every day, put up the guard, but you don't do anything about it. But enforcement actually meaning you take further steps. In other words, tell the person, if you don't put up the guard, I'm going to give you a verbal warning. Or next, it's a written warning. And then out of that, after that, it's actually a dismissal because I don't want to go to jail if you lose your finger. So the employer's got to basically prove all of those requirements or the duties that he has done uh, as required in terms of Section 8 before he can then say, I'm not held liable for this incident. Right, then you can also incur personal liability in terms of the OSHAC, for example, Section 8, which is obviously the duties imposed on you as an employer. So if you don't follow through, or you didn't comply with your duties, or even in terms of Section 14, which is the duties of the employees, especially thinking of the horse play and that, you can also be held liable in your personal capacity if it caused an incident. Then you also get something like joint and several liability, where, for example, one or two people together can be held jointly liable for an act or an omission. So, for example, a uh, director says to an employee, go dump the chemicals in the river, right? So, obviously, if they fi find, then both of them can be taken jointly or in the individual capacity as well. And then you also have something called strict liability. That is typically, if you think about you driving 80 in a 60 zone, that camera catches you, right? You don't still have to go and prove intent or anything. You just give you're going to go pay pay your fine. So that's basically around. Obviously, there's more types, but that's basically what we focus on. Indemnity agreements. I don't know if you're familiar with indemnity indemnity agreements. We didn't sign any indemnity agreements when we came in this morning. So normally, with indemnity agreements, we normally say that it obviously, if you sign that document, you're saying that you will not sue or take any action. Um, against the party or the company or the premises, right? if you should suffer a loss or an incident. So with indemnity agreements, normally we're saying it's a grey area, right? but it's um, obviously we're saying because you can't contract out of gross negligence, especially in terms of Section 9 of the OSHAC, where we're saying, the OSHAC is saying that you um, do not run your business at the expense of other people's health and safety. Right? So normally, when as inspectors, when they sign indemnity, they will always tell the security guys at the gate, you know, I'm signing this indemnity form, but that doesn't mean that in terms of Section 9 or in terms of the OSH Act, that you are, um, that you're off the hook. So you, you're signing away the fact that you won't sue them civilly, but the state can still take action against you if there was negligence on your site. Right, and that's why for some companies, 
uh, induction is imperative. So always ensure that when people or visitors come to their site, they are informed of the hazards and the risks right, that is um, expected on the particular sites. Right, so normally when we talk about the OSHAC, a lot of the time students always say uh, they've never had any exposure to the OSHAC, they don't know how to deal with the OSHAC. So just to give you an, a quick roundup, we've got an OSHAC, and normally your OSHAC has got, if you open it up, it's the same as any other act, it's got a short title, and it will show you the assented to date, that's the date where the president actually signed the, the act into force or into law. And then you have your preamble, that's normally what the Act makes provision for, and obviously with the OSHAC we know it makes provision for the health and safety of um, people at work, for the use of plant and machinery, and even for persons other than um, employees, and also, also to establish an advisory council for the minister, because we know the minister obviously needs some information, some support around safety issues in industry. Then also the, the Act has got sections and regulations, so what I normally show to students is, because sometimes they would refer to a regulation and then they would say it's section so and so. It's important to know that the sections is the front part of the act, right? So you will have from 1 up to 50, sections 1 till sections 50, that makes up the sections of the OSHAC. And then the rest of the book obviously is your, your regulations which give you the more specific requirements, more detailed requirements. Right, and then the act has also got um, annexures. Annexures is normally examples of certain documents that you would uh, be using in industry. So if you wanted to know what should be in your first aid kit, for example, there would be an annexure showing a list of typical items or minimum required items. Also, there would be an annexure showing you how you keep record of your incidents at work. Right? IODs, they show you what the uh, copy of the annexure one looks. Then there's also examples of um, a COC, what a certificate of compliance looks like if you had your wiring done, your electrical wiring done. Obviously, that electrician gives you a certificate of compliance. They give you an example of what that looks like. Also, if you are uh, using a boiler, right, pressure equipment, that boiler must be registered. They also give you an example of a certificate of registration for your boiler. So that's basically annexures. And then the, also, the Act also gives you incorporated standards. So a lot of the standards, the SABS, or the SANS as we know it nowadays, are incorporated into, into the OSHA Act. Right? So a lot of the detail that we find in the SABS codes, right? so the, the Act will refer you to the SABS codes if there's more detail required. For example, if you wanted to know in terms of, like your electrical wiring is done in terms of SANS 1042, or um, like your facilities regulations, if you wanted to know, you said you've got 200 employees and you want to know how many toilets you have, right, for, for males and for females, the OSHAC is, what, is not going to give you that detail, but it will refer you to a specific code, a SABS code, right, where you will obviously get that detail. So it's obviously, it won't be practical if we had all the SABS codes in the industry incorporated or added to the Act, you know how big would this Act be? So it's obviously just more practical just to show it because there's a section that says the minister can incorporate um, codes into the OSHA Act. Right? That then makes it part of the Act. In other words, if you follow the code, you're complying with, with your, with your OSHA Act. That's basically the, what an Act consists of. Right, so I'm not going to do go through all the sections of the OSHA Act. I'm just going to touch on some of it. Obviously, I've mentioned a few already around Section 8 because Section 8 is obviously the most important section in the OSHA Act regarding the duties of the employers. And I always say to students, Section 8 normally gets tested during an incident investigation. Right? So normally when we say the first thing, if you have an incident, somebody got injured, the inspector asks the person, right, have you been trained? Yeah, the employer says, yes, yes, he's been trained. And then he turns around and he says, no, but that training was done in Afrikaans. I'm a CORSA speaker. I didn't understand half of the, of the training session. Right? So then obviously that is not regarded as training. Right? Or sometimes it's easy to say, yeah, but you took a shortcut uh, when you operated the machine. When you take a piece of gum and you dip in down the uh, operating buttons and all of that. But then on the other hand, the inspector will ask the employer, was there a safe procedure? Right? So obviously if there's no safe procedure, and as an employer, you didn't perform your duty right, to make sure that the worker is following the safe procedure right, in order to avoid that incident. 
Right, so normally, and also risk assessments, that's the first, one of the first things that an employer must do. He must first find out what are the hazards and the risks that employee is going to be exposed to before he allows the guy to go out and perform that work. Other important sections, section 23, that prohibits the deduction from any payments, from people's salaries, for any articles or items that's um, issued in the interest of health and safety. Right? And normally we're saying that you read with general safety regulations too, that talks about the issuing of personal protective equipment. So a lot of times we have debates around this in the class and students always say, no, 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 we have to pay for our PPE. Right? So in terms of legal requirements, it is the duty of the employer Firstly, to find out what are the risks attached to the work that's going to be done. And if you can't take away the risks, try to obviously try and mitigate it, but then last resort would be to issue the PPE free of charge. Also the responsibility of the employers to maintain it and even to provide safe storage for it. Right? So normally we have cases where employees phones in at the, at the department speaking to the inspector and he says, now my boss sent me home uh, because I didn't have my safety shoes. And he says, no work, no pay. But I can't help it if they stole my shoes last night. Right? So the inspector will always turn around and say, but in, as an employer, it was your duty to not allow that um, personal protective equipment to be taken or removed off from the site. Right? So you can't then charge uh, people to, um, or expect people to pay for their personal protective equipment. Right, so earlier we were also talking about section 14, the duties of employees, and we're saying it's not always that employers will be held liable for any incident that could happen on your site. It could happen that even employees can be held liable in their personal capacity, especially if it can be shown that they were not taking care, right, like we normally we refer to the, the horseplay and the tomfoolery at work. So normally the guys jump onto the forklifts and they jump, and they drive around, they chase around their colleagues. Anything can happen, you can bump into your colleague, right? And if your employer can prove, no, that you didn't have a permit to operate that forklift, right? You know, you've been disciplined before because it's not the first time you're doing it. So if the employer can prove that he's done his uh, duties to avoid incidents, then it can come to you as an employee, right? So it's important that employees know their, their duties in terms of Section 14 because they can be held liable in the personal capacity. Right. And again, also, we always remind um, people that if you are issued with any personal protective equipment, guarding and things like that, you don't interfere or you don't uh, vandalize it. Right? So sometimes people get issued with PPE and they cut off the fingers or they make the soccer hats from the hard hats and that. Right? So that's obviously also not allowed. Right? Especially for, for businesses, if you are going to manufacture um, articles and items for use at work, then we normally say it is your duty to ensure that that item, whether it's a machine, whatever, is going to be used in a safe manner. Right? So the only time, so normally we're saying you're going to be held liable, but you can actually have an undertaking if you are, if, if the person who's purchasing that machine from you and he says, you know, it's fine, I will make sure that I put up the guard and I will make sure that it's safe for use when I use it. If he signs agreement with you, obviously liability is taken away, taken away from you as the seller. Right, who's responsible as the employer? Normally with incidents, we're always saying, every, students normally say, right, they've got a section 16-2 appointment that they have to sign, but they're too scared to sign it because they don't want to go to jail. Right, so normally we're saying, in terms of the OSH Act, your CEO is regarded as the employer and who's always going to be held liable and responsible to ensure that the OSH Act is complied with. But in terms of Section 16, Top 2, they say he may assign any duty to a person to assist him with um, carrying out his duties. Now, a lot of times in industry, um, there's misinterpretation around the subsection, right? So I always say to students, if you have your, the, the act doesn't specifically say it must be done in writing, first of all, right? But we know in industry it is done because otherwise how are you going to show that duties have been discharged? But strictly speaking, it doesn't say the appointment must be done in writing. And then we also say that person must be under the direct or subject to the control and directions of the CEO. So in other words, the 16 tool reports to the CEO with regard to health and safety, and he only follows instructions from the CEO with regard to carrying out certain duties. So for example, the 16 tool can come to the uh, 
the 61 or the CEO, and he can tell the, the CEO, we need to put up some guards because the guards are all shaking loose, the plant is old and what have you. But if the CEO says to him, hang on, uh, we might buy new machines, we're not going to do that now, right? obviously you are following instructions from the CEO. So if you're not covering the machines or you're not supplying the guards, and if something should happen, you can't be held liable for it because you were acting subject to the control of the CEO. Right? Because we're always saying the CEO will remain responsible and accountable. I always say to students, if you don't have the authority right, to carry out certain duties, right, you, won't, you might not be, you can't be held liable or responsible, if you, can't, you can't be held liable for it if you didn't have the authority to carry out certain duties. Right? It always goes, the responsibility must go in line with the, with the authority to carry that out. Right, I'm not sure if you are familiar with she representatives, so normally at companies, the she rep also is uh, part of the, the she structure that helps the employee also to assist in um, implementing the health and safety uh, committees and that at the, at the workplace. So normally your safety reps is nominated and elected, right? So the, the she reps are part of the, the labor force and they are nominated and elected by their fellow colleagues and fellow employees to look out for the health and safety right, of the fellow employees. So they would normally do inspections, um, investigate incidents, and recommend, make recommendations to the employer with regard to health and safety issues. Right? And as we say, they cannot incur any civil liability. So in other words, a fellow employee who maybe had an incident, lost a finger, they can't say to the sheriff, uh, if you did your inspections, I would not have lost my finger, so I'm going to sue you. Right? So in terms of the OSHAC, that is not allowed, right? because it distinctly says no civil liability will be incurred. Right? And then also, if you have more than two representatives at your company, naturally you will inform health and safety committees. Right? So the same with the committees, they also make representations to the employer, they discuss um, incidents, and they keep record of any recommendations that were made in the interest of health and safety. And again, also we say, even committees cannot um, be sued if they maybe drag their feet on a certain issue, right? That resulted maybe in an incident, because this, the OSHAC is specifically saying they will not incur any civil liability. Right? When we talk about she, the Safety and health and the ES aspect obviously goes around environmental um, requirements. So a lot of times now in industry, the focus is no longer just on health and safety. It's also on companies' environmental aspects, right, and, it, and the impacts it might have on the environment. So we normally also cover environmental legislation in our training. So to start off with, in terms of principles, we're saying there's a few principles that runs through all environmental legislation. And the first one is the one that is the polluter pays principle. Right? So in other words, if you're going to, if you're going to court, be caught um, polluting, you're going to be paying. Right? So whether it's a fine, whether it's a jail term, whether it's a rehabilitation, but that is where this principle comes in. Also the other principle commonly used is the cradle to grave responsibility, where they say the responsibility exists, whether it's a project, a service, a program, right, from its beginning to, to, till the end of its life cycle, till the end of disposal. Then there's also another principle that we have to apply, which is the best practicable environmental option, or the BPEOs as it's referred to. So they say in industry, companies must look for options, right, that can help them reduce the impacts on the environment, right, and that is what we refer to, so we say there's different techniques, the bats, and referred to as the techniques. And then also, Common, another common principle we use is the sustainable development principle, where we're saying in development, the development must meet the needs of the current generation without affecting future generations' ability to meet their needs right, in their day-to-day -day operations. Other interesting facts around NEMA, right, like I said earlier, it allows for both criminal and civil liability. Right? And <coughs> whereas the OSH Act has got set fines, so for, for example, the OSH Act will say um, in the event of a fatality, what have you, the, the maximum fine will be two years jail t term sentence or 100,000 rand fine or both, right? Whereas with environmental legislation, it's open, right? So the fines can go up, up into millions for any contraventions that, that was found. Right? Also interesting, you can actually have the protection in terms of uh, Section 29, 
if you refuse to do work that's environmentally harmful. So in other words, you can say you refuse, but then you must know for sure that your, the action would have done serious and imminent harm to the environment, right? Then nobody can harass you, nobody can victimize you or sue you, take any action against you. The same with whistleblowers, that's what they call the pimpers. If you see something wrong and you want to pimp, blow the whistle, right? So too, you will have the protection in terms of Section 31. But again, they're saying, right, they're warning that you must know for sure that your action is going to cause serious and imminent harm, right? You don't want to defame a company. Right, other legislation that uh, also normally has got health and safety aspects to it is obviously the Compensation for Occupational and In Injuries and Diseases Act. And this act basically deals with the fact that you have, um, you can get compensation, right, if you sustain an injury or a disease, if you suffer from a disease, an occupational disease. So normally in the COID Act there's a schedule that allocates certain amount of money to certain parts of your body. And right? so if you lose a thumb, that's worth so much, or if you lose a foot, it's worth so much. So there's normally mainly two categories that can claim, which is your employees, and then naturally your dependents of your employees. In other words, if the employee died, the dependents can obviously claim maybe that pension that was due to you. Right, so normally we talk about, if, especially if you are contracting, your client would normally expect you to come and produce a section 89 or a letter of good standing. Right? So that shows that as a contractor you are in good standing, you are paid up with all your assessments. Um, and then obviously the, the, the important thing is why clients must make sure that they are, their contractors are in good standing is that if they're, not, if they're not registered, if they're not in good standing, they can actually claim. So if the contractor's employees gets injured on your site, they can actually claim from your fund right? if they're not, if they're not registered. Right? So, even casual employees, right, because they are seen as employees, casual employees can also claim from a compensation fund. If you are members of body corporates, can also claim. And if you are a labor broker, if, you, if you're registered as a labor broker, your employees can also claim from the fund. Interestingly, I always say to students, a labor broker is defined in terms of, in terms of the OSH Act. An employer is defined which, that does not include a labor broker. Whereas the definition in terms of the COID Act, the labor broker is also included under the definition of an employer. So I always say to students, it's very important that you understand the scopes of the, of the different acts because the definition will actually tell you. So if you think in terms of health and safety, uh, a labor broker does not have to, uh, when he brings his staff, provide training or provide PPE and you know, supervision and things like that because that's duties of an employer. And in terms of the OSH Act, the labor broker is not seen as an employer, right? But whereas with the COID Act, he's definitely seen as an employer, and that's why his employees can also claim compensation. Right, so people that can't claim, obviously, people performing military training, members of the police and the defense force, and obviously even your domestic workers in your, in your house. So normally we know they can claim uh, from UIF and, um, what is it? Um, yeah, unemployment, right? So if, if you obviously let them go, they can claim unemployment, but they're not covered in terms of, of compensation. Right, so just for interest, I don't know if you ever had any experiences with uh, an inspector uh, when they come out, obviously, to enforce health and safety legislation. So normally students ask, you know, when do inspectors come out, right? So it's either if you have lots of incidents that you usually report, you will actually be on a routine schedule. Like normally over a two-year period, they will come around routinely. If you have lots of hazardous chemicals or lots of dangerous machinery. So normally I say to, to, to students, with inspectors, if you see money going around, then you must know there's something wrong because inspectors don't work with money. They basically issue notices. The basic issue notices, and there's three different types of notices that inspectors can serve on you. The first one, which is the one that everybody usually is scared of, which is the prohibition notice, because as it says, it prohibits you, it stops you from carrying on with your activities. So say, for example, an inspector came out uh, to your site, maybe during an incident investigation, a person fell into a machine, and the inspector feels that if he leaves now, somebody else is also going to fall into that machine, is going to serve a prohibition notice on you to stop you from carrying on with that um, activity, or carrying on with using that machine. So what normally happens is 
as uh, when a prohibition notice is served, there's no time set on it. That notice will stand until such time you have now fixed that machine. Right? So think about it in industry. If you have a prohibition notice served on you, you have to now first finish. So say, for example, your machine is a, a German machine, and the guard that you're going to get to cover it is only from Germany, and the guys are striking, and what have you. That prohibition notice will stand until such time you obviously fix, fix that situation. The other notice they can serve on you is a contravention notice. A contravention, as it says, you are contravening some particular regulation in the OSH Act, right? So maybe your machines are not guarded or what have you. It can serve you a contravention notice. And that contravention notice is usually valid for 60 days. So within 60 days, you've got time to uh, put up a guard or appoint your um, first aiders or get your reps or do your load testing on your cranes or what have you. Right? So you will have 60 days. And then an improvement notice is usually served when employer, where there's no specific regulation that was contravened, but in the inspector's opinion, you think you can maybe improve on a particular situation to increase the safety thereof. So I always say to students, the powers of an inspector is not absolute. Right? You can appeal. So if you think, for example, if a prohibition notice was served on you, and the inspector closed the whole plant, and you think that was unfair, it was only one machine that was involved, you could have been using the rest of the, the, the lines, you can actually write to the chief inspector, right? you don't even need to have a lawyer. Right? So put something in writing where you, where you obviously explain your, your concerns. But that doesn't mean uh, it suspends, it, it, the, the, it con uh, cancels the, uh, the notice. Right? That notice will still stand until such time the chief inspector has given his, his decision. Right, then also they've got other powers. They can request any document, any register, can look at your surveys and things like that. Obviously medical information, I normally say to students, they can ask for anything, but they can't ask medical information. We know that is usually confidential. Right, and if, especially even during incident investigations, if there are any guards and things lying, shrapnel lying around, they can take it. Right, and use it as evidence during the investigation. But normally what happens is they will give you a um, slip to say that they've taken, taken something off your site. Right, and then in terms of environmental legislation, normally we know it's the Environmental Management Inspectorate that comes around. But other than the OSH inspectors, they also sit at a municipality level. Right, besides the provincial, also at municipality levels. And they also have the mandates, um, obviously, of enforcing environmental legislations, they can issue permits and licenses, they do inspections, right? They can even cancel disqualify permits and licenses. Right? So criminal offences seen under NEMA, like right? even false information, hindrance, etc. Right? And we could say we normally we normally um, also refer or know them as the, the green scorpions. Right, so with, with occupational health, obviously we say Occupational health, in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, what is occupational health? So we're saying it's concerned with the occupation, task, substance, processes, or circumstances which may affect the person's health in the workplace. And we normally say it's a combination of occupational hygiene, occupational medicine, and occupational nursing and primary health care. And interestingly, if you had to compare the definition of occupational health uh, as it is in the uh, OSH Act, the uh, OSHAC doesn't refer to primary health care because normally for, we do this for same track purposes and we normally say in industry you have at your company you will have your clinic where your um, medical staff, your occupational health staff don't not necessarily only do medical surveillance right and your audiometry and that but they also provide limited primary health care services right so you can come for your um, flu shot or your vitamin A shot or your vitamin B shot, right? And sometimes they even have what is system moldered, your uh, four food middles, <laughs> right? That they also make provision for. And that is that falls under primary health care, but there's no legal requirement for that in terms of the of the OSH Act, right? We just know in industry those services are provided at companies, obviously, who's, um, who can afford it and who's got that benefits. So what is occupational hygiene? Occupational hygiene so as we said, occupational health consists of occupational hygiene and the medicine. So what, so what is hygiene is the anticipation, recognition, evaluation and control of condition arising in or from the workplace which may cause illness. So normally we're saying everything in the working environment that can affect your health 
is seen as occupational hygiene, right? So normally what we're saying, um, we have noise, you've got um, vibration, right? You've got ergonomics issues and chemicals and that. So everything that's, that's in the working environment that can affect your health is then seen as um, occupational hygiene. So normally you will get your occupational hygienist in. I'm not sure if you are familiar with people coming in to do your noise surveys or your chemical level measurements and that. They are obviously referred to as the occupational hygienist. Right, so they will come in because there are certain legal requirements in terms of the OSHAC that says how often your noise must be monitored, how often your chemical levels must be monitored. Right, so those are legal requirements. And it is stipulated that you have to get the services of an approved inspection authority. Now, normally we say an approved inspection, an occupational hygienist is an approved inspection authority when they, they are an approved inspection authority only if they are registered with the Department of Labor to come out to do those surveys for you. Right? So just know, out in industry, sometimes occupational hygienists do work, they might have the um, equipment and the instrumentation to do these measurements for you, but if they're not registered with the Department of Labor, you still have to get an AIA out afterward to come and verify the surveys that they've done for you. Right? So it's got to be an approved inspection authority. So sometimes they also help with training sessions. They can do risk assessments for you, obviously, because they know they study. It's a field that they study and specialize in around the, st the stress source and the hazards that you have in your workplace. Right, they can also serve as an expert witness. So in other words, you get, you've get got court cases that comes down and obviously if they ask for evidence around what was the level of the noise, what was the level of the chemicals and that, they can also come in and bring their reports. It's admit, it is admissible evidence, right, because it's legal requirements for them to do the, their surveys. So normally what they, like I said earlier, what they would look at is chemicals, physical, is like illumination, noise, thermal, ergonomics issues, right even biological rats and that running around. All the things that can affect your health in the working environment. So with medicine, what is medicine? So we're saying occupational health is high occupational hygiene and occupational medicine. So medicine is obviously to do with the prevention, the monitoring, diagnosis and treatment of illnesses. So we're saying with, on the occupational hygiene side, we're saying there's things in the working environment that can make you sick. On the medicine side, we're saying right, we know you're exposed to to things in the environment, stress or hazards, and then you can, the, you, you are exposed to things in the working environment, now we're gonna try and diagnose you and treat you for that um, disease or um, illness that you picked up in the working environment. Okay, so they say occupational medicine is a specialist discipline, right, so it's not just the normal GP that sits at your company, it's an occupational health medicine practitioner or a health, occupational health nurse, Right? And then obviously within the ambit of occupational medicine, you have your baseline medicals, your periodic medicals, right? So once a year, once every two year medicals that the guys come for. You get a post illness injury, you can even get exit, exit medicals. When the guys leave your employee, they have to go for an exit medical because normally companies need to keep record of what was the health status at the time when the, the employee left, left your, your working, your service. Right, so medical surveillance, in terms of legal requirements, your employees must be placed under medical surveillance if they are, especially if they are exposed to certain chemicals as listed in the hazardous chemical substances regulations, or obviously as often as the occupational health medicine practitioner will prescribe for them to come. Right, so now we're dealing with management systems. I normally say to students, if you, the buzzword nowadays, everybody wants to be ISO recognized and get that recognition and get the certification. But it's also, it's very important that you realize that it's first, make sure that you are covered in terms of legal requirements, because as inspectors, they can walk into your site, you might have your ISO certification, and you might think that you are safe, and, but they can still write up contraventions in terms of legal requirements. Right? So in other words, the worst thing that can happen if you don't comply with legislation is obviously that you can get a fine or you can go to jail. Right? But if you, if, you, if you don't get your certification, the worst thing that can happen there is obviously competition, you won't get business and things like that. But I always say to students, make sure the first that you know what your legal requirements is and make sure that you 
comply with that before you get to management systems. Now, so I'm sure you've heard of management systems. Um, normally they say it can be defined as being the leadership and control required within an organization in order to manage a given discipline. So that management system normally gives you the structure within which you operate to manage your discipline. So normally we say, she is our discipline, safety, health and environment, right? And there's particular, there's hundreds of different management systems out in the industry. So whether you're in IT, in HR, in the food industry, the motor industry, there's different management systems that can assist you to manage your, your discipline. Right, so the common ones that we normally work with, obviously, is the ISO 14000, which is the environmental management system, and that's the management system that helps you to manage your environmental aspects that could have impacts, impacts on the environment. Right, the ISO 9000, obviously, is the quality management system. I'm sure you've heard of that one. Normally, you will see it on your, uh, the juices and the products that you have out in the industry where they, they brag on the, um, on the labeling that they are ISO certified. If you watch the weather forecast, even the weather forecast is also ISO 9000 certified. Right, and then we know the OSHA's 18001 was the management system for health and safety, but we know obviously there's been changes. And they've actually postponed it till next year for companies still to get in line with the changes to um, conform to the ISO uh, 45000, right? That's the health and safety one. And then with ATNOSA, obviously we have our own um, she, what we call a she management system, it's an integrated management system. Um, where the difference comes in is where we're saying the ISOs are uh, run independently, right? So you would, at your company, you would have a separate department managing um, environmental, doing the uh, um, ISO 14000 standard. You will have a separate department looking at quality and a separate department looking at health and safety. Whereas with the NOSA standard, we're saying it's an integrated standard. We're doing it, all, everybody's doing everything at the same time. Right? So normally with a management system, it consists of different elements, right? and it's scattered around a deeming cycle. Right? So we're saying uh, the deeming cycle is named after this W. Edwards deeming that came up with this management system theory. And he came up with this um, plan, do, check, and act um, methodology in terms of how you can go around or go about implementing your uh, management system. So they say the simplicity is actually lies, its strength lies in its simplicity. So whether it doesn't matter in which industry you are in, which management system you are using, you can um, follow the same methodology of planning, doing, checking and acting. So normally this is the typical um, elements that makes up your management system, right? So what we're saying is, for our uh, she, for example, for a she management system, it consists of elements. Now, the elements in some in the, in the ISOs they would refer to as clauses, right? And it will give you some guidelines in terms of how do you go about implementing your your standard. So, for each of the elements, like I normally say to my students when we do the NOSA standard, each of these elements you have to write a procedure, and following that procedure, you are actually implementing the standard, right? So your CMB001, in terms of the NOSA standard, will give you guidelines as to what should be considered when you're writing your procedures. For each element, you're going to have to write a procedure for implementing your, your um, management system. And that, like I said, follows a simple methodology, planning, doing, checking, and acting. So for example, under planning, the requirement will always be that you have a policy. So if you think about it, the ISOs, for example, if, you're, if you have the ISO 14000 standard, you will also have a policy, an environmental policy. And what is a policy? The policy is normally where you, the company shows the commitments and the promises, right, with regards to managing the environment. So in other words, they would say, um, that for the, if it's an ISO policy, right, it will read, we are committed not to harming the environment, try to reduce the generation of our waste. And they won't say anything about health and safety because that's not their focus. Whereas if you are a company that's implementing the OSHAs or the, now the new ISO 45000 management system, if you read their policy, they will make commitments and promises around health and safety issues, right? So it would read, for example, we are committed not to harming the health and safety of our people and our community. They won't say anything around environmental issues or quality issues because that's not their focus, right? So it doesn't matter which management system you have, right? Everybody, the requirement is there that you must have your policy showing the company's commitments and promises. 
right? And normally you'll see the policy is usually signed at the bottom side and dated by the CEO or the MD, right? And normally that is what auditors, when they come in, they will check up, is there a signature, is there a date? Because we're always saying, what good is a policy if there's no signature on it, right? It's not worth the paper that it's, that it's written on. Other requirements, um, for example, is a risk assessment. So we're normally saying, if you are um, implementing the ISO 14000 standard, you, there's a requirement that you, look, you identify your environmental aspects and your impacts. In other words, your hazards and your risks around environmental issues. If you are um, implementing the ISO, the OSHA 18000, obviously the focus there is health and safety. So the risks that you identify is only going to be in terms of health and safety. But with the NOSA standard, we normally say, it, because it's a she integrated system, when we do risk assessments, we not only identify health and safety risks, hazards and risks, but we also look at environmental aspects and impacts in one go. Right? So you won't have three separate um, risk assessments. Uh, with an integrated system, you've got one system. The same as with a policy, you've got one. One of each, but it includes, it's inclusive of safety, health and environment. Right, other obviously the legal requirements, also another uh, requirement for your uh, management system. You basically have to make sure that you find out what are the different legislations and municip municipal bylaws that you would um, have to comply with. Right, some companies have lawyers that they call upon to assist them in compiling a legal register. Right, I don't know if you maybe have a fortunate enough to have that service. But other than that, safety officers normally would sit and um, look up for what type of permits and licenses and things um, they have to, to, to get to in order to comply with that particular le legislation. Right, so there's hundreds of different legislations and bylaws that could be applicable, applicable to you. And then normally we also we talk about you set objectives and targets, so especially if you're saying you're doing risk assessments. But you, if you just do a risk assessment, in isolation, it's not going to mean anything to you. But if you do it as part of a program, right, and you set objectives and targets around it, obviously then it's going to have more meaning to you, right? So you say, if we have uh, finger amputations or um, cuts or burns or what have you, set objectives and targets around it, try to reduce it or minimize it or to eliminate it. Right, so you will have procedures for all, for all those elements showing at your organization or in your company, how do you go about doing that. So the same with your risk assessment. Your procedure in your risk assessment will actually say what type of methodology are you using. So there's hundreds of different methodologies around risk assessments. It's going to depend on what is it that you want to see from your risk assessment. So normally with, with our she risk assessments, we're normally saying we're only interested in seeing what is the health and safety risks. We're not interested in seeing what is the cost involved of a particular risk, even though we're saying Risk financing makes part, forms part of a risk management model, but we're more focused on just finding out what is the health and the safety or the environmental impacts from our activities. Um, right, so that is in terms of your, your procedure. Also with, with regard to risk assessment, just remember it is, besides the fact that it's a legal, legal requirement to do risk assessments in terms of Section 8, it's, you can see here it's also a requirement to do risk assessment in terms of your management system. Right, other elements around the management system, obviously, um, what is this training, communication and consultation. Normally we're saying with our she management system, we're saying at our company we will have procedures to show that our employees are also uh, consulted and we communicate uh, with them regarding she issues. It's not a case where we have employees working and you know tomorrow they see there's somebody coming around to do measurements or there's new machines coming in and they don't know what's happening in terms of you know the noise levels are going up or we are using new chemicals. They're not aware of what's happening. In this element, you actually have to write up a procedure to say, how are you gonna go about um, communicating and consulting with your employees regarding she issues, right? Structural responsibility, that's another element that normally talks about how you go about doing your appointments, right? So normally I say to students, you get different types of appointments. You get your appointments in terms of legislation, 
where the legislation actually says you appoint the person in writing. So with the Section 17, your health and safety reps, they are appointed in writing. I don't know if it's in construction, a lot of the construction regulation appointment it says appoint the person in writing. But then you also have appointments that's required in terms of your management system. Right? So your management system might have appointments for uh, a ladder inspector or for a stacking and storage supervisor, which is not a requirement in terms of legal. Right? So a lot of companies will have fire marshals and evacuation marshals appointed. There's no legal requirements for those appointments, but it is a requirement in terms of your management systems. So I always say to students, if you get audited and that auditor asks you for your ladder inspector, appointment, you can't say, no, but it's not a legal requirement. He's not benchmarking you on your, uh, on legislation, he's benchmarking you on your management system. Other procedures you have, will have in place, obviously, for your emergency planning, right? how you do your drills, um, your spill kits and training around uh, emergencies and evacuations and all of that. The checking, the checking quadrant normally talks about your, um, where we talk about you are being proactive in terms of um, monitoring and measuring. For example, we were talking about occupational hygiene. Occupational hygiene monitoring is where somebody comes out to monitor the levels of your noise or the levels of your chemicals. Right? That falls under monitoring and measurement. And at your, your company, if you are implementing a management system, you're going to write up a procedure in terms of how do you go about monitoring on different levels, right? Whether it's in, in terms of occupational hygiene, whether it's in terms of occupational medicine, because there you're monitoring the person. You're either monitoring the working environment or you're monitoring the person in terms of medical surveillance. But you can even monitor the extent to which you um, meet your objectives and targets. So in your procedure, you actually say on with different levels where you do um, monitoring and watching and checking. Right, so auditing, obviously when you're auditing, you will have a procedure for even for audits, how you do audits at your company. You get internal audits, you get external audits. An internal audit, I always say to students, you actually prepare for your external audit because you go through the same elements, right? Making sure that you've got everything in place. So naturally with auditing, there's normally um, benefits to your um, internal and external audits. Why would companies, because external audits usually are very expensive, but Companies would budget for it, they invest in it because that's the only reason or the only way how they will get recognition right, from an external party. Right? So you will only get your certification through an audit if you are obviously complying with your management system. Right? So what an audit, an audit normally entails is the auditor comes in, he asks you for all your standards or your procedures around those elements and if you're following what you're saying you're following in your standard, right? you get your, your recognition. The last quadrant, which is the ACT quadrant, I always say to students, I think this is one of the most important elements of implementing a management system, which is the management review. Management review, what does that entail? Top management comes together, they discuss the management system to see if this management system is still working for you. In other words, they can say, they can go around and say, well, we do our risk assessments and we set objectives and targets, we do our appointments, we send out people for training, we do audits and all of that. Right? So either it's working for us because we can see we, there's a reduction in our incidence. Right? So it's either it's working for us, yes, we will keep this management system and we'll carry on and try to improve on it. Or if it's not working for us, we kick it out, we get something else. So some companies might feel uh, we've had it with no sir, we go to the ISOs, <laughs> or it could even be the other way around. Right? But I always say to students, it's important because if, if nobody looks at your management system, like you're going to be, you know, like that hamster key, you, you, every day as a safety officer you do your appointments and you send people for training and that, but you don't know where it's going to, where it fits in. Right? But when you see it's, if it, it part, forms part of a management system, somebody's looking at the system in order to get continuous improvement, right? shows where, where, you, where you're heading towards. And like we're saying, continuous improvement is the driving force for any committed management system. It's never ending. Right? You always, so we're saying, we're starting off with legal, legal compliance, but that's not... It's not, it doesn't end there, right? We also obviously want to strive, strive for world's best practice, and that's obviously where the management systems comes in. You are on world's best practice. So now that the, the key word obviously also is sustainability, where people, companies are saying, um, it's no longer, you don't longer just focus on um, the financial bottom line, 
if you think about all the incidents that happens out there, like the one of uh, Marianne Roberts where that bridge collapsed, immediately that in, the, in the news that afternoon they were saying the shares dropped. Right? So if there's incidents happening out there, it goes into the media, everybody sees it, and immediately people say, no, we don't want to do business with you. Right? So it affects your financial bottom line. So more and more companies realize it's not just about making money anymore, it's not also about what they call long-term viability and prosperity. In other words, to be a sustainable company. Right? So we're saying sustainable development, where we say it meets triple bottom line considerations. In others, where we're saying all three systems, your um, economic system, your environmental system, and even your social system, um, is equal, is regarded as equal at the company. Right? Because we're saying um, the company depends on the people, the community to come work for them. But the company also depends on the water, the resources. But in the way the company is doing the business, they must not be polluting the water, because we're saying for future gen generations, there must still be water available. So if you're manufacturing juice, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, you still want to have water resources available to make your juice, right? And the people that works for you, they must not be suffering from occupational illnesses and diseases and all of that, because we're even considering their um, health and well-being as well. So we're saying that is basically what the triple bottom line is all about. Um, to ensure sustainability is where you ensure that you have your economic system, social system, and your ecological system all on equal um, importance, right? You're not just focusing on making, making the money. Right, so what we're saying is, in terms of achieving the sustainable uh, company, we're saying you start off with legal compliance, right? that is the basis, but then you can also branch out into your um, ISOs, the external management systems, and then also, to get to the top, we're saying there are some management systems that even incorporate <laughs> principles of corporate governance, good corporate governance, how directors must behave themselves when they are obviously managing the company, not just in their own interest to enrich themselves, but also obviously to look at stakeholders and shareholders as well. Right? So when they implement a management system and also include um, principles of good corporate governance that also you are well on your way of um, attaining an organization that's sustainable. And that's, that's basically it. I hope I'm within time. Thank you, Valdila. Um, normally after these presentations there's this big quiet in the room because I think we sit down and we digest and we measure where are we as business people so we were talking this morning, part of the transition in South Africa for many of us, we were always employees. When we listen to these things and this presentation specifically, is pitched for small business people. So when we listen to it, we listen to it with another ear as employers and our responsibility towards our government and our communities and our employees. And we better understand where do corporates come from when they talk to us about these policies and these procedures. So normally the quiet in the room, I do understand it because even for myself listening to the presentations, you become so aware of our responsibilities further than just ourselves. So thank you so much for listening. Obviously, our wish is for you guys to go back and go and implement what you were taught. Go and think about this, but then there's the action part that we also heard of this morning. Where do we go in terms of actioning what we, what we heard this morning? So thank you so much for coming. I think we've also promised that we will have a lucky draw where you will stand a chance of winning a course facilitated by NOSA that we said is an entry level in terms of safety when you enter any site. So just in putting the names of the people into the draw, I've noticed a lot of um, government people here today, like I said, our deputy mayor, people from the municipality, representatives from ArcelorMittal. So I think you won't mind that I didn't include you. In the lucky draw, I only have our small businesses in the lucky draw. I think what I'll do, I'll have our Deputy Mayor come and do the draw for us. Um, 
Ian is not here today, but his wife is here, Marilyn Matruis. Um, they have a guest house in South Africa. Okay, people, that concludes our day for today. You are welcome to join us for a cup of coffee, and obviously networking is as important as safety. Enjoy. See you next month.